continue our <coughs> studies here in Romans chapter 6. <laughs> do hope I'm doing a good enough job explaining everything to y'all. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I will on some things more than some people in my life. But Paul is often very repetitious in his writings. Mm -hmm. What must be important for us to pay attention. Right. <coughs> If you recall from our previous lesson, we talked largely last week about how we should live now that we are under grace and not under the law. Mm -hmm. How that grace is not a license to sin, our Christian liberty is not an excuse to do what we want to. Rather, the freedom we have in Christ is more, we could say, it's not freedom to live as we want, but freedom to live as we ought. Mm -hmm. Amen. But now Paul begins kind of continuing on the thought from verse 13 about yielding ourselves to righteousness instead of unrighteousness. And we'll pick up here in verse 16 and 17 today. He says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. <coughs> Excuse me. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that former doctrine which was delivered you. Amen. Well, he begins by getting this question which we've seen before, know ye not? Or, you know, don't you know this thing that he's about to say? Amen. And what he's about to say seems common sense, but apparently in Paul's day, common sense wasn't all too common either. Right. He says that to whom ye yield Yourself servants to obey his servants, you are to be obey. That is, whoever or whatever we yield ourselves or give ourselves to in obedience, that's that person or thing is our master. That we are their servant if we obey whatever it is they are commanding of us. Mm -hmm. so there are, I know we don't have servants and masters in the same sense that they did in that day. The closest thing we have is our our bosses at work, really. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have to do what your boss tells you to do, or you're probably going to get in trouble. And if you keep disobeying, you're eventually not going to have a job, right? Well, Larry and his nursing job didn't do what his boss said. I'm sure it would be detrimental to not only his job but to the patients in the nursing home, right? You know, whoever we yield ourselves to, Paul says, that is our master. That's who we're servants to. So that should seem like common sense, but in this aspect, we only have two choices, and we're, we can't serve both. Amen. Uh, Matthew 6, 24, I think we all know that scripture, but it tells us that you can, no man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or he will cling to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but here we have sin and righteousness, and we can't serve both of them. We can only serve one, Paul says. And he goes on here to say, whether of sin or death or of obedience unto righteousness, and we will serve one or the other. Either we will serve sin or we will serve righteousness. There is really no in between, right? So it should seem like common sense that like whoever we obey, that is our master, but we must yield ourselves either to sin or we must yield ourselves to righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that is the struggle, if I can say that way, of the Christian life is what do we give ourselves over to? <coughs> so that unlike our boss at work, a master in the sense of master and servant or master and slave is the master has complete rule and control over the servant. Right. So the servant is completely obligated to follow the master's orders. <clears throat> even if that those orders are detrimental to the servant, even if those orders are against the servant's morals. That is why we are not to be the servants of sin, because it's not going to be <clears throat> good for those who serve sin. Right. right. You know, it would be like 
a piece of machinery that we own today, or a car or truck or brother. <coughs> it's a truck, he could take it and go as fast as he wants to and drive it straight into a ditch, but it's not going to be good for the truck. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's his truck and he can do with it as he wishes. As an insurance company might not, uh, not like that too much, but right. If you want to run off into Cumberland River, and some people do, mm -hmm. that's his truck to do with it as he wishes. That is the same type of thing as with the master and servant. The master can do with, with the servant as he wishes, whether the servant likes it or not. Right. And that is really where we need to realize that we are either serving God or we are serving sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that master, whichever it be, has control over us to do with us as it pleases. The problem is we can't just sin a little bit and then think we can keep it under control. Sin will only take over more and more in the life of a child of God. Even for the unsaved, sin just completely controls them. Mm -hmm. and that is why we have such wickedness in our day to day because sin fully controls those that are not his. <laughs> They're, you know, aside from some social reason for being, quote, good, man left to himself would fall completely after wickedness. You're right. Because it says here that we are either the servants of sin and the death, that is, sin always leads to death. <laughs> sin Physical death is the result of sin. We will, because our flesh still sins, it will experience that unless it's changed one day. Mm -hmm. well, spiritual death has been the result of sin all the way back to the garden. And even a more looser sense, sin separates us and our fellowship from God. You're right. But that's really what death is, is a separation. Physical death separates the soul from the body. Spiritual death separates us completely from God. So when we sin in this life, it separates us in our fellowship from God. Like Isaiah chapter 50 makes that very clear. He says, it was the hand, Lord's hand is not short that he cannot say, there's ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Mm -hmm. and the problem is not that God cannot hear our prayers, not that he cannot do as he pleases. <laughs> the problem is that he is not going to hear us when we have open sin in our lives. Right. Just living in sin and thinking he's going to be pleased with us. <coughs> and then we wonder why things such as a revival don't come. We don't see much move among God's people today. It's not a problem with God, it's always a problem with us. Amen. It says sin, we either are the obedience, or excuse me, the servants of sin <coughs> unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Mm -hmm. And so obedience is, of course, in a, a good sense here, obedience unto God, and that, he says, brings about righteousness. Notice it doesn't say it brings about life. You know, sin always brings death, but obedience cannot bring life. In fact, we only can obey God because He gives us life. Amen. We just say it, it brings about righteousness, but not in the sense of righteousness before God. But it brings about righteousness in the sense of how we live and conduct ourselves. Mm -hmm. That we have a life that's pleasing unto God, and we can live such a life. Amen. There are some today that would think, make you think that you cannot live a life pleasing unto God, but I think the scriptures tell us contrary to that. There are, there are some that say, well, whatever's going to be, will be. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what you do. And some go to the far and say, well, in effect, they blame God for their sins and their lack of serving Him. But we all are accountable for the life in which we live. And I think Enoch is the best example of how we can live a life pleasing to God. Right. I know I've used him a lot as an example and 
always pattern my ministry because he had the testimony before his translation that he pleased God. Mm -hmm. And as it's written in Genesis, he walked with God, he was not for God took him. And yet there is really no reason why we could not walk with God just the same as Enoch did. Really no excuse of why we cannot live a life that pleases God just as he did. Well, I think I mentioned them last week in our lesson when we were talking about how we are living in the age of grace and we have really many more tools and advantages than even Enoch did, I believe. And yet I say most of us fail to live even halfway to pleasing the God as Enoch did. Right. I want to turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 real quick. <laughs> First Timothy chapter six. Here, Paul is given several warnings and commands about how things we are to watch against, such as covetousness, desiring to be rich, the love of money. And that famously misquoted verse for love of money is the root of all evil. Right. That's verse ten and then verse eleven. <clears throat> but thou, O man of God, flee these things. And all these things he has mentioned before, disperse disputings of being proud, doting about questions of some strikes of words. All these things he says we're to flee from these things. But notice what he says after that. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You bad. He tells us to fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We were to flee all of his wickedness, and he says to, to follow after. And the sense of that word means that we were to pursue it intensely. Amen. <laughs> after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, all these things we are to strive after in our Christian walk. You know, certainly we have righteousness in Christ. That is the only way to stand righteous before God. Amen. That is a blessed privilege, but that does not excuse us from living godly and righteously in this present world. So I think we looked at that last week in Titus, where it tells us that the grace of God teaches us that we are to live <laughs> godly, soberly, and righteously in this present world. If he has the scriptures show us the way of righteousness and yes a good church and pastor and teachers expound the word of god for us but just simply the holy spirit and grace in the life of a believer is enough to teach us that we are to live pleasing unto god mm -hmm. but here paul tells us that we are going to yield ourselves one way or the other either to righteousness or to sin the difference is Really, which one do we strive after? Do we strive to please the flesh and serve sin, or do we strive to please God and serve righteousness? Amen. That's where verse 17 picks up here, and back in our text, it says, But God be thanked. You know, do we give God the thanks for change He has made in our lives? Do we give God the thanks for change He's made in others' lives as well? That's Really, what Paul was thanking God that he had made a change in the life of these Roman believers. Mm -hmm. well, he wasn't thankful that they were once the servants of sins, but he was thankful that they were delivered from that. As he says here, would God be thankful that you were the servants of sin? Well, we should be thankful unto God when he delivers one from a life of sin. Amen. And really, if we be honest, anyone that he saves has been delivered from the life of sin. Whether they were a very wretched man in our eyes, or whether they were a pretty good person, if they have ever truly been born again, then they've been delivered from being a servant of sin. Mm -hmm. Notice he says that it was in the past tense here that they were the servants of sin. 
that we that are saved aren't the servants of sin any longer. But as we saw in verse 14, it no longer has dominion over us. It no longer has the rule and reign over us. And I think sometimes we ignore that, that we are no longer the servants of sin. Yes, this flesh was still struggle with sin, but this new man within us does not. Amen. <coughs> yes, surely. That's really a big chunk of chapter 7, as we'll see when we get into that. that Paul, even himself, struggled with sin in his flesh versus what he would desire to do in his spirit man. But ultimately, sin has no more dominion over us. Right. Yeah. Well, I know it's an out of the ordinary world where you pick up the song book and that song we sang, first, I think it's page 182, just sweet to trust in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Read verse 3 for us. <laughs> the songwriter got it right here. <laughs> yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. The songwriter knew that in Christ we can cease from sin and from self. Amen. And there's many today that try to speak about it in their own way. We joked a little bit about the, the holiness type of Pentecostals earlier. They believe that you can work your way to perfect, sinless perfection. Mm -hmm. But no, that type of sinless perfection is only found in the person of Christ. Amen. You no, know, Christ died that we might have a victory over sin and death. We, not, we need to be careful of clinging on to that sin and saying, well, I'm still a sinner. Well, yes, we are. In the flesh, we are still a sinner. But that shouldn't be our whole identity. Right. Amen. God has saved us by His grace and the scriptures they over and over again, we're referred to as saints. I've heard, I hear many today, well, I'm not a saint, I'm just a sinner. Well, that's, and you're not saved, according to the scriptures. Right. And I'm no saint. I think they get that thinking from the Catholic Church, because mm -hmm. their quote, saints are people who live exalted to higher than they should be standards. And right. They've exalted to places of what they call veneration, which is really nothing short of idol worship. So no, we are no longer the servants of sin if we have truly been born again. Right. Sin, as he says in verse 18, we'll get to next lesson, we have been made free from sin. Amen. That we were the servants of sin. And our, before the Lord saved us, we were most certainly the servant of sin. It controlled our every <coughs> thought. It really had sway over every action that we took. <laughs> You're right. No matter how good of a person we were, yet we were still controlled by sin. Our maybe our, our actions might not have been outwardly, outwardly, outwardly wicked and vile on the side of men, but to be sure our inward actions were wicked inside of God. Mm -hmm. But now he says, now that we are no longer the servants of sin, he says, we're, in the next part of our verse, but ye have obeyed from the heart. And here is the difference between those who are truly serving God and those who just are putting on the outward show. Mm -hmm. And the true servant of God serves God from the heart out of a, a love for God. John 14, 15 tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. You bet. But there's others who seek to just put an on outward appearance of serving God, just like the Pharisees did. The Christ of them, but they draw an eye to him with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. Well, there's many days that will put on an outward appearance of righteousness. But what did Christ say? Those type of people, inwardly, really they were as <coughs> ravening wolves. As ravening wolves, as they are like the white sepulchre, beautiful on the outside, inside full of dead men, bones. Right. 
You know, they wash the outside of the cup, but the inside is still filthy. That is the condition of all those who just put on the outward appearance of God, or serving God, and haven't obeyed from the heart. Amen. You know, they will go about trying to show you how good they are, what they're really doing for God. They're, they might not say these words, but their actions say, well, look at me and look what I am doing. Mm -hmm. But no, him who is truly serving God seeks no recognition of his own, does he? You know, going back to the servant and master analogy, <laughs> The sin seeks to destroy, sin seeks to separate us from God. Yet God being our master, his ultimate goal is really to bring glory to himself. Right. That is why we are saved, that's why we are serving. That's really the whole, of, for lack of a better word, goal of creation was to bring glory to him. You're right. There's lots of man-centered theology today that wants to say that, well, it's all about us and what God can do for us. Hmm. No, we are the servants and he is the master. We are to do his bidding and seek ultimately what his end goal is. You know, while I'm there at work, I, my job is to make sure we put out good radiators. <laughs> That is the end goal of the company there. It's the end goal right. of my earthly master, if you will. Now, certainly in the process, I get benefits and pay and all these other things. <laughs> but yet, the company doesn't exist to profit me, it exists to profit itself. Right. And so much the more is it with God. He doesn't exist to profit us. But certainly we do receive great blessings from him. Mm -hmm. But ultimately we exist to profit him, if you will. To bring glory to him first and foremost. If we are serving him for any other desire, then we're serving him the wrong way. First, let's go back to first Timothy 6 real quick. I want to point us out something here that I noticed when I was reading through this. I've read it before, but never put the two thoughts together. You know, he tells us that <clears throat> he brought nothing in this world, and certainly can carry nothing out. Having good and raiment, there would be content. I think we all heard those verses before. He tells us in verse 9, They which will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And that's those who seek after riches. We also go back to verse 5, and notice what he says here. We'll look at verse 4 as well. He says, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil, surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdrawal thyself. Mm -hmm. Is that not the basis of <laughs> prosperity? Teaching today, exposing that gain is godliness. Really bad. <laughs> that they equate earthly success with spiritual success. Well, if you're a godly enough person, God will bless you financially. That is the modern day prosperity gospel. Right. And yet, Paul himself says in the very next verse, but godliness with contentment is a great gain. Here you go. Gain is not equal to godliness. Godliness is not a way for us to profit financially. And yet there's many today that are following such teachings. Right. No, I know we God chastises us, God rewards us, He blesses us. But uh, we don't need to be deceived into thinking that we can serve God good enough and He's gonna give us everything that we want. 
especially when it comes to fleshly desires. Mm -hmm. That's where the prosperity gospel starts to go off track. Cause they, they mess up, they mix up fleshly desires and spiritual desires. Because God says he will give us the desires of our heart, not when our heart is set on wickedness, not when our heart is set on things of this world. And it's a, a side note, but it goes along with our thoughts of living righteously in this present evil world. And let's go back to our text and we'll finish up here. You know, it says that we have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. This form of doctrine is the principles of Christianity or what's called the faith in other places. <coughs> that a child of God, a true child of God will follow after God's word. You know, we, I'm not saying we will keep it perfectly. You know, always do everything it says, but if we're truly saved, we will strive to serve God and keep his word. Amen. The faith begins first and foremost with the gospel, but then it spreads out all the essential teachings of the truth of God's word. And yes, there's nothing more wrong with doctrine. Some people shy away from that today. I heard an advertisement on the radio a while back. It was still a gospel station. It was a church that didn't have any denominational doctrine. I was kind of wondering what kind of doctrine they did have. Right. And the doctrine is just simply teaching. And it's the word of God is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for cor correction and righteousness. Amen. No, we have been delivered the form of doctrine or the faith, if you will, right here in God's word. And Jude 3 tells us that we are to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And somewhere along the way, churches stopped following the doctrine which were once delivered to them. Amen. We, I think we can all agree that the church of Rome, somewhere along the way, fell off the bandwagon as the same goes. Amen. That's how we ended up with the Roman Catholic Church and then all the things that came from it. Luther had some things right, but he was still wrong in his motives of trying to correct the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Calvin got a few things right, but he got a few things wrong as well. He the same was the same motive as Luther was. Right. All the reformers had were just simply Catholics trying to fix the Catholic Church. That's it. And lots of good things came out of Reformation. I won't disagree with that, but the problem wasn't that we needed to fix the Catholic Church, is we needed to return to the true Church of God that had been here since the days of Jerusalem. Maybe the days of Christ, if you will, in Jerusalem. <laughs> make one last note here before we close. This form of doctrine, this word form indicates that it was a, it's like a mold or a casting. Or, you might think of it like a concrete form. When they form up concrete, it, right. doctrine is, what, is the mold of us in our Christian walk. Amen. Just like that. Form molds the concrete in the shape you would have it to you would have it to go. The doctrines of the word of God are mold us into the servant of God that we are to be. And really from that basic <laughs> essentials of the truth of God's word, we are we can grow in more and more doctrine. Amen. We can go on from the milk and unto the meat, as it says. We can go on from doctrines of babes and to learn the more meatier things of the Word of God. So anyone who doesn't agree with the very basic essentials of the Christian faith, if you will, they are not Christians at all. The Mormons, they cannot be called Christians because Amen. they have follow just the very basic teachings of Christianity. You're right. The Jehovah's Witnesses are as Brother Keener used to call them, Satan salesmen. Mm -hmm. They are not 
qualified to be called Christians because they deny right. the divinity of Christ. There are, there are many other quote, denominations that deny basic Christian teachings, but if we do not have that, then we cannot call ourselves a Christian. They bad. But we should not stay there at the very basic thing. We should go on to the deeper and more precious truths. That Christ was born of a virgin and was lived a sinless life and died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. That's about the, as basic as it gets. And that, those are very precious truths and we should love to hear them <clears throat> over and over again. That should not be the whole of our theology. That could be the sum and substance of it. But we should know more than just simply those very basics. I'm going to turn and raise one place and we'll put those in Hebrews. This is in my notes, so I'll have to find it. I think it's in Hebrews chapter 10. Maybe further back in that. Hebrews chapter 6. We'll begin verse 1 here. He says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Mm -hmm. And we are to have the very principles, but we are to go on unto perfection. So we're on to completion, we might say. Mm -hmm. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Mm -hmm. And this we will do if God permit. Right. So all those things he lists there are supposed to be the very basic teachings of Christianity. He says, let us go on from those to perfection. Let us progress. You know, in our walk with God and our understanding of scriptures that we would know more than just the basics. Right. That's how many, I think, even good intention saved people sometimes get tripped up with heresy and false teaching because they don't know anything more than the very basic milk of the Word of God. Right. You know, certainly it's important that Brother Larry and I and Others who are teachers know more than just the basics, but it's not, it's still the responsibility of every child of God to, to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah. Just because one doesn't have a public office in the church doesn't excuse them from knowing more than just, than just Jesus <clears throat> and save sinners. I know that. Mm. If that's all you know, then. Blessed be God that you know at least that. <laughs> if after 50 years of serving him, that's all you know, then you never grew in grace. Amen. That's the point I'm trying to I guess, make here is that we need to grow in our knowledge of the Word of God and the doctrines which it teaches. And the, the principles of Christ are most precious to us. Mm -hmm. We should cling very tightly to those as Jude said, earnestly contend for those things. But we should not just be content to stay there and not learn any more of the Word of God. Amen. All it will do is help us to serve God more. It will help us to stand more in all of Him the more we understand of Him and His Word. And that's one thing after nearly 20 years of serving Him and studying His Word that I've learned is that the more I study of Him, the more in all I am of Him. How Amen. Great God truly is, and how little we truly are. So let us <coughs> go on unto perfection, as he says there. Let us heal ourselves to righteousness and seek to live a life that is pleasing to God. Amen. Lord willing, next time we'll pick up with the thought that we are free from sin. Amen. Amen.